Our scripture reading for this morning will come from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Our text, again, is Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Beginning with verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. One of the most penetrating questions that needs to be faced on a recurring basis and answered with bold honesty is put this way by the late Brennan Manning. He said, it is symptomatic that in the Western world where the church is over 2,000 years old, the mass of people still pass Christianity by. And then the question, why? How would you answer that question? Why is the number of people willing to embrace Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the Lord, Messiah, King, why is that number still as small as it is? Brennan's answer Because the visible presence of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in Christians as a whole, apart from a few individuals, is no longer present. People don't see enough of Jesus in those who profess to be following him. The Holy Spirit is more quenched and grieved than he is welcomed and celebrated. That's what Brennan would say. The distinguishing features of a Christ follower are are no longer in sharp contrast to your average Westerner or American. So we have to ask the question, has the salt lost its flavor? Paul writes this letter to Titus on the island of Crete to make sure that the sound doctrine the Christians there were learning and professing to believe, he writes this to make sure that that doctrine is rightly transforming the way these new Christians were living. Knowledge of the truth that shows up in godliness is how he puts it in the very first verse of the letter. Christians are people, think about it, who testify that we have been raised from spiritual death to a whole new way of life. We testify that our stony hearts have been taken out and replaced with new hearts that are soft and pliable in God's hands. And instead of trying to follow an external law out of duty, we testify that his word has now been written on our hearts so that we follow him from the inside out. And we testify that we have a new power at work within us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. 
and that God's Spirit is living inside of us to empower us for obedience and good works and holiness. And we have a hope inside of us that is stronger than death itself and a future ahead of us that is unimaginably glorious. And we testify that all the combined suffering that we may ever have to endure in a thousand lifetimes is not even worth comparing with the glory that we're going to experience soon and very soon. Everything has changed for us. The old is all gone. The new has come. And when all of that has happened to you, it has to show up in the way you live your life. If all of that's true of you, it has to show up in the way you relate to others. Because we have not just turned over a new leaf. We've not just launched a self-improvement plan or decided to go to church or to try and become a better person. No. We are people upon whom God has acted. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. And we are now God's workmanship. He is at work within us and through us to accomplish whatever pleases Him. And this is not mere reformation. This is a complete, irreversible, inextinguishable transformation that has happened to everyone who is in Christ. And if there is no visible evidence of this transformation by the way we're living, then our first order of business has to be to get on our knees and plead with God that in His mercy He might forgive us and renew us into His likeness. Transformation is the theme of our text today. And in the first couple of verses, they highlight some distinguishing character traits in someone who has been transformed by the gospel. So if you want to know what those are, you look at the first two verses. Then verse 3 reminds us of why the gospel, the, the incarnation, the perfect life, the sacrificial death of God's very own Son, why that gospel is our only hope. And finally, verses 4 to 7 recount the breathtaking elements of the action that God has taken in the gospel to ensure that we will make it safely home to the Father's house. We begin in verses 1 and 2 with what that transformational change looks like, gospel living. Remind them, Paul writes to Titus, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. The first thing to notice is that the Christians on Crete already knew these things. They just needed to be reminded of them. In other words, they're a lot like us. And th this is why it is so crucial to establish regular time in God's Word for us because we forget. We might have read Titus over and over and over again, but every once in a while we need to go back and we need to review it so that we remember if you need help getting into a pattern of spending time in God's Word, then just click on our website, 44life.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, and you can sign up there for daily scripture and prayer videos with me. Now, that doesn't mean they're great. It just means this would be a good way 
to spend regular time in the Word of God and understand it more clearly. Or there at the bottom of the page, you can sign up for women's Bible studies that are beginning this summer, morning, evening, online. But we need to be reminded of the Word of God, not just learn it once, but be reminded. Our real life is not sustained with carbohydrates and proteins and fats. Our real life is sustained and nurtured by the Word of God. And like me, you may have even memorized much of it as a child. But that does no good if it is not germinating and bearing fruit in the way you are living now. God is not going to be impressed just because you know a lot of the Bible or even that you've memorized a lot of the Bible. It's those who obey that enter the kingdom, Jesus said. John Stott writes, there are many warnings in Scripture of the dangers of forgetfulness and many promises to those who remember. A bad memory was one of the main reasons for Israel's downfall. They soon forgot, we read. They did not remember And Jesus had to make the same complaint to the apostles. Don't you remember, he said to them? It's hardly surprising then that the leading apostles, Peter, Paul, and John, in their New Testament letters, all stress the importance of their reminding ministry. So that all conscientious Christian teachers, Stott says, once they have been delivered from the unhealthy lust for originality, take pains to make old truths new and stale truths fresh again. What does Paul have Titus remind the Cretans of? Seven commands. Remind them, he says, to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Well, that's a real popular one. Everybody loves to submit. Submission in the New Testament is not just a quality that God's Spirit nurtures in a godly wife. Every follower of Christ is to practice submission. In this case, submission to rulers and authorities. Think of the context now. At the top level of government, for the Cretans, this means submission to the Romans who had subjugated their island in 67 BC and the yoke had not worn easy around the neck of these violent, volatile Cretan people. And yet when they come to Christ, when Christ comes to reign in their hearts, It is now their calling to submit to the very ones who have dominated them. This is a radical teaching. Submission for the believer is not unconditional any more than it is for a wife to her husband. Your husband does not become your Lord. We do not worship the state. The emperor, the king, the president is not our Lord, but... We submit because we believe in a higher authority than the state. And we believe that that authority has delegated authority to our rulers and those who serve as authorities over us. You can read about it in Romans 13. There may come a time when our submission to God collides with our submission to the state. And there should be no doubt which one overrules the other. We must obey God rather than any human authority. It's how Peter put it in Acts 5, 29. So it's not absolute. But that also does not mean that we submit only when we feel like submitting. Brian Chappell writes... National authorities are not all that we must consider when applying these instructions. 
Rulers and authorities will concern our people when they try to build or repair buildings, including churches, according to city codes when they have to conduct business according to the laws of commerce or drive according to the traffic laws or run schools according to state standards or pay workers according to government regulations or pay taxes according to the laws of the city or the state or the nation. For people to actually submit themselves to civil authority according to Scripture is going to require examination and correction of virtually every area of daily life. And Chapel says we will not escape this because we happen to be in church ministry. I have yet to work in a religious setting where we did not face unreasonable standards or officials that inhibited the progress of our ministry. And every time there is a temptation to think that Because the authorities are not reasonable, our obligation to submit to them is annulled. Many seem to think that they have a responsibility to submit to authority only as long as they agree with it. Only as long as they think it's fair. Only as long as it doesn't require too much inconvenience. But ultimately... A church community that does not submit to governing authority undermines the authority of the Word of God for the church and for the lost people who are observing us. And it's no wonder then that Paul places such a high priority in his writings on submission to the authorities. People transformed by the gospel Honor the supremacy of Christ by submitting to other authorities. And the next command, they are obedient to them. They are ready for every good work. This one may still refer to civil matters, exhorting Christians to be engaged in their communities for their good, but Paul is beginning to broaden the application here. But what he's saying is, once you embrace the gospel, it doesn't mean you turn your back on the community and that you have nothing more to do with these pagans. In fact, like Jesus, peering out over Jerusalem, it actually increases your burden for your neighbors. And it would be a good practice from time to time to sit down and reflect with God's help how we could do more good in our neighborhood or in our town. We we want to be the kind of people that take the position of readying ourselves to be able to meet needs and to be able to do good, be ready to do good. Glancing at verse 2, you can see just how all-encompassing the directives are here. In verse 2, he begins with the absolute no one, and he ends the verse with all people. When Jesus changes your heart, when the Holy Spirit is alive and active within you, verse 2 says, you'll know it because you will stop talking negatively about people. You won't slander them. You won't tear them down to try to make yourself look better. You won't pass on gossip. And this may not happen all at once, I know that, but when you are converted to Jesus Christ, your tongue is converted with the rest of you. It's a wholesale makeover. And of course, you will still speak the truth in love. It doesn't mean that you just overlook evil or you don't uh, tell the truth like it really is. You still speak the truth in love. But what happens when you are converted to Christ and the gospel does its work within you, it means that you commit to restrain your natural inclination to say the worst about people. You also renounce any disposition to quarrel with them and argue. Instead, you pursue peace in your relationships. 
The following phrase is very similar. Your life is going to be characterized when the gospel does its work. Remind them of this, Titus, that their lives are going to be characterized by a gentleness, which we know is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has all of you, you display a supernaturally empowered ability to not just react, to not dominate, to not have to win the argument, to not lash out at people. This is a mark of the Holy Spirit. And the final directive here builds on that. You, quote, show perfect courtesy toward all people. So that pretty much covers it, doesn't it? No loopholes, no excuses um, because of your nationality or your family dynamics growing up. No, you are a new person now. And when the gospel does its work in you, everyone you encounter gets respected. Every person you interact with gets treated politely. And you might say, that is too high a standard. I could never do that. And you'd be right. Because this is what God does. God has to do it in his people. It doesn't come from you. But it will show up when the gospel grows down into your heart. This is a representative list of what a person lives like when the gospel does its transforming work in them. Some of us are living this way, and we will not live this way instantaneously, nor will we ever live this way perfectly, but we are to live this way discernibly. People should see this difference in us in comparison with the culture around us. And imagine that this is being taught to the Cretans. Remember, they are notorious for treachery and violence and sexual corruption of every kind. And now the gospel got a hold of them and think of the change being called for and described here. Now they are submissive, obedient, gentle, and courteous men and women. That's the wow of the gospel right there. Then verse 3 tells us why the change was needed as we hear about gospel necessity. Verse 3, for, so remind them to live all of these ways, Titus, for, here's the ground, here's why, for, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. So we're not passing this on because we're better than other people, Paul would say to Titus. We all were like this. Seven characteristics that summarize the realized depravity of every person in their natural state. You never have to be taught how to be this way. They are foolish, which means what? As opposed to living wisely. The starting point of wisdom is fear of the Lord. We see in the book of Psalms, more than one place, it says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so a foolish person in a New Testament sense is a person who lives without taking God into account. And we all do that by nature. We are disobedient. That is, when we hear there's a God, we're rebellious to him. When we hear the word of God, we're, we rebel against it. These are people who are, who are led astray. They're deceived, perhaps by the deceiver himself. They're now believing his lies, ordering their lives according to lies that he's fed them rather than the truth. 
And this leads to their enslavement to passions and pleasures tyrannized now by the very practices that are freely chosen, even though they'll destroy them. But they still keep doing them because they're enslaved, living in malice and envy. These are the kind of people who always seem to have a kind of grudge below the surface of their lives. They're just never fully and genuinely happy. They look at other people and they get jealous of them and they they live with a kind of gnawing feeling that somebody somewhere is depriving them of what they're really entitled to. Eugene Peterson paraphrases the verse this way, it wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. No one has to teach us how to live in these ways, how to be disobedient to authority or how to be jealous when other people have good things. Nobody has to teach us to pursue things that destroy us. We just do it because this is how we're naturally wired. It's how we are broken as part of a fallen human race that has rebelled against God. And this is why our only hope to change, our only hope to experience transformation has to come from outside of ourselves. We didn't need just to act out according to a new game plan. We didn't just need a new dream. We didn't need just a new set of goals. We needed to be acted upon. And that's exactly what happens in the gospel. It's not a call to a new, uh, new set of rules how to live. It's a change on the inside. It's an announcement of what God has done in acting upon his people. Verses 4 to 7 then tell us how we have been changed. The gospel dynamics of what God has done. Verses 4 to 7. So we all used to be this way, but, verse 4, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but He saved us according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Stott says that this is perhaps the fullest statement of salvation in the whole New Testament. Others have pointed out that it is the only place in all of Paul's letters that he talks in some detail about the new birth. So these are crucial verses for us to know and understand. In fact, they answer a number of key questions for us related to salvation. And the first question is this, who does the saving? Here, who does the saving? Verse 4 says that God is the one who is the Savior. That's why I love the benediction. It's my favorite benediction to use from Jude, where it says, Now to the one who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without any fault and with great joy to the only God who is our Savior. God saves. And then, toward the end of verse 6, it says that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And both are true. It's a rescue plan that is all of God. One scholar said, in the salvation of human beings, God is wholly subject. Men and women are wholly objects who receive the action of the subject. That's Good news to those of us who know that we are incapable of saving ourselves. When you're in recovery, you hit bottom and you realize how helpless you really are unless God does something here. On what basis does he save us? Verse 5, 
not because of works that we have done in our own righteousness. It's, it's not because of works. We always default to works when it comes to salvation. We always think, you come pre-wired this way, that if I just tried harder, did better, God would love me more, and I could have more confidence that I'm going to be saved. That's all false teaching, false doctrine. You're not saved by good works that you have done in righteousness. You are saved by only one thing, based on one thing. And what is that one thing according to this verse? Mercy. That's, that's how you get saved, the mercy of God. We receive a pardon we do not deserve. But because it's based on his mercy and because we never deserved it in the first place, that is why it's secure. Tim Chester said, it's worth asking ourselves, how would I complete this sentence? He accepts me because... Dot, dot, dot. He accepts me because... That might be a good way to begin a gospel conversation with someone. Everyone finishes that sentence in some way. God accepts me because... What does the text say? Mercy. How does he save us? Middle of verse 5. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, we are cleansed. We're cleansed by the will of God the Father, purchased by what God the Son did on the cross, and here applied by the work of God the Holy Spirit. It is the washing of regeneration. It is a whole new beginning. If you said, oh, if I could just start all over from scratch, if I could have a clean beginning, that's true of us. We are not people who have been repaired. We are people who have become a new creation of God. We are made new. The renewal of the Holy Spirit here is virtually synonymous with regeneration, but it also has a kind of a subtle nuance of the moral transformation that takes place within your heart. God does it. He does it through the work of the Holy Spirit, cleansing us through and through. Do you know that you are clean before God? There's so much freedom and peace to be found when you know you are clean. Why does He save us? Toward what end? What is the goal? Verse 7, so that being justified, that is being declared not guilty in God's sight, being declared clean in God's sight, being justified by God's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs. Whenever we get to a statement like this in Scripture, I just almost find it too magnificent to even believe. Look at this language and see if it is part of your identity, how you think about yourself. The same thing is taught in Romans 8.17. Since we are God's children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs, with Jesus Christ. That's almost too much to let sink in. Heirs of all that God has. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And this transformation that we're experiencing now because of the gospel is only the beginning. N.T. Wright says, God wants to continue the work of revealing himself to the world. The creator of the world is a lavish host who has sent out a worldwide invitation to his party. And we, as his messengers, must live in such a way that people want to show up at that party. So do, Jesus, do, do people see Jesus visibly in the way we live. 
Well, one of the most moving true life stories that illustrates this, I heard from Christy Wilson. Um, Christy Wilson, Tony Campolo, two of the greatest storytellers I ever met in my life. And Christy Wilson was a great uh, missionary statesman before he went home to be with the Lord. He tells a story, true story, of two brothers, Samuel and Peter Zwemer. Together with James Cantine were the uh, pioneers in reaching Muslims, and they were two men who became greatly loved by the people to whom they ministered. When Samuel Zwemer was a senior at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, he went to hear a talk by Robert Wilder, uh, the man that God used to start the student volunteer movement. Some of you who know the history of Christian missions are familiar with that. If not, you can go home and just Google student, missionary, or student volunteer movement Go to Wikipedia, you'll find its description. It's amazing. Wilder was visiting college campuses to recruit students for missions. And at the end of his talk, those who felt moved, he would call them to come forward and sign a statement, quote, God helping me, I purpose to be a foreign missionary. At this particular meeting, Robert Wilder was standing before a large map of India. In front of the map, there was a large metronome that you use to keep time and music ticking away. And Wilder said that every time it ticked, someone in India died without ever having heard the gospel. And as soon as Samuel Zwemer heard that, he knew that he had to commit his life to telling people about Christ. And no sooner had Dr. Wilder finished speaking while the metronome was still ticking, he rushed up to the front and he signed his pledge. And then Dr. Zwemer wanted to go to the most difficult mission field in all of the world, and so he studied where that would be. And he came to the conclusion that Muslims in Saudi Arabia were the most resistant to the gospel of anyone in the world. And so, of course, that's where he was determined to go. But no mission board would send him there. They said, you're just going to be killed. We would just be sending you to your death. We're not going to send you. And because of that response, Samuel Zwemer and James Cantine set up their own organization. They, they called it Arabian Mission. Each of them went to the churches and raised support for the other. If God calls you to go to a place like Arabia and no mission board will send you, Samuel said, we'll just bore a hole through the board and go anyway. And that's what they did. They went to Beirut and then they went to Cairo, which is where they learned their Arabic. And then they traveled all around the Arabian Peninsula looking for a place to start their mission. And after scouring it thoroughly, even going into the inland regions of Arabia, they set up their mission in Basra. And then they started one in Kuwait and then in Bahrain, and then in Muscat, Oman. Peter Zwemer, Samuel's brother and a wonderful young man of God, came to Muscat then himself as a missionary to start an orphanage for African boys there. And while Peter was in Muscat, the, the British Navy captured and held a slave ship in port and that's because by that time, Britain had outlawed slavery. And the ship had left Africa and was on its way to Saudi Arabia to sell the slaves, 35 little black boys who had already been branded. But after capturing the ship, the British didn't know what to do with these 35 boys. And so Peter Zwemer stepped forward and he made an offer to the British. And he said, I'll take care of them. And so they entrusted the 30 five black boys who had already been branded for slavery to Peter. And Peter took them and housed them and he provided beds for them and food and clothing and he even started a school for them and he taught them the Bible in addition to English and the other subjects. But then while Peter was still a young man, he got very sick and eventually died and was buried there in Muscat. Years later, his brother Samuel Zwemer returned to Muscat preaching in Arabic. He told the people 
about Jesus Christ. Oh, but we know him, someone interrupted. Oh, no, you've got me wrong, Dr. Zwimmer said. This is someone who lived many, many years ago. And he went on to tell them about Jesus Christ, how he loved little children, how he had done so many good things for people, and how he'd even given his life for them. And then they said, oh, we know him. No, you don't, Zwemmer insisted. He lived a long time ago before you were even born. And he just continued talking about Jesus until all the people finally raised their hands said, but we know him. And then they proceeded to describe Peter Zwemmer, his brother. Like Jesus, Peter had loved the children. And like Jesus, he had had compassion for people. He had done so many good things. And like Jesus, he had given his life for them. And Christy Wilson concludes the story by saying, what a wonderful thing to be mistaken for Jesus. Why are so many people passing Christianity by? They don't see visible presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit in our lives. May God so work that people begin, if not to mistake us for Jesus, to begin to identify us with Jesus as the supreme treasure in life. That Titus chapter 3 would actually be fulfilled in us until they say, we know the Father sent the Son here. We know that Jesus is real because look at the way they live. Let's pray. Lord, how often we have settled for a list of rules or just uh, trying harder to do religious activities how often we have settled for something far less than the gospel. But, but my prayer for myself and my brothers and sisters here and those listening online, my prayer is that your word, the word of the gospel, would so take root in our lives and so permeate the way we think and the way we live that, that it would transform us, God. Deliver us, please, from a kind of Christianity that demonstrates no distinction from our world. And may we so live that people would identify us as Jesus followers because we increasingly look so much like him. Do this, I pray, Father, because your son is worthy of it. And do it for the good of your people, we pray in his name. Amen.